Yes.
essentially just taught normal medicine, not tech savvy, not future medicine, normal medicine across into a video chat without really using the technology to add any extra features. And so that traditional breed of telemedicine, in my mind, falls into a few different categories. The first is what we just talked about around teleconsults, basically just doing the same as a normal medical consultation, but over video chat. The second I would call teleradiology. There's some overlap between the first and second, but essentially this involves sending <coughs> images remotely for interpretation and then back to the patient. This is a picture of a mobile eye truck that um, has been deployed around India. And basically this allows people to get uh, basic eye exams as well, well as retinal scans. But the primary health workers that man the trucks aren't really able to interpret those retinal scans. So they're sent to um, a, a, you know, a central interpreting center with specialist ophthalmologists who then do the interpretation and send the result back to this roving man. And in this way, they've been able to deliver specialist care to you know, tens of thousands of people across rural India. Teleradiology. The third category is what I would call telesupport. This is something that has emerged in particular over the last 10 years or so, where essentially a doctor at a big tertiary hospital advises medical staff at more distant centres. Right? And some quite interactive um, kind of technological architectures have been set up for this kind of thing. You have rooms in clinics now, especially in remote hospitals, where uh, a doctor can actually remotely control different aspects of that hospital room. There'll be a camera which the doctor can control. There might be, uh, you know, you, you can see here the doctor remotely is just practicing on a mannequin, but this is actually deployed in a number of regional settings um, where you basically have this virtual doctor controlling an almost robotic room and, and, and delivering specialist support when there is none. So this particular example is from a program called Teleconnect at Boston Children's, um, where they connected specialist pediatricians with uh, more remote hospitals. And then finally, I think still within this umbrella of traditional telemedicine is the broad church of mHealth, mobile health. Uh, the World Health Organization, research organizations like the George Institute that I mentioned earlier, have been working for decades to develop mobile health tools, predominantly for low resource settings. There's an excellent resource which I'd encourage you to have a look at called the MAPS Toolkit, which has been published by the WHO. Um, and the purpose of that is really to to distill best practices from now about 10 years of specialized WHO program in mHealth and give you almost a recipe for how to develop and importantly how to implement a mobile health tool in a low resource context. Interestingly, the use case where this has been, I think, had most success so far is in maternal uh, health obstetric care. Right? You might have heard of a lot of examples of very simple SMS-based reminders to mothers in low and middle income countries to essentially shepherd them through um, prenatal and postnatal care in situations where they can't access community health very easily. This is a picture of one such initiative, and the text is a little bit blurry, but basically, you know, on this mm. kind of uh, you know, smartphone devices saying, is your baby refusing feeds, not responding, or floppy? These are signs of illness in babies, and um, he needs to go to the clinic straight away and visit you know, this site. And simple as that is, of all of the fancy gadgetry in telemedicine and mobile health, these initiatives are probably the ones with the most evidence behind them, and that have created the largest public health impact to date. 
very simple SMS spectrum ID um, for, for neonatal care. And the reason why that works particularly well is that there are fairly standardized protocols around you know, what to check for at certain stages of gestation and of child development, what immunizations does the child need to get. Uh, it is essentially you know, using technology to deliver what is already a highly protocolized, structured care plan. This is a map drawn from what I think is actually a really well done uh, PWC report outlining various mobile health initiatives around the world. Uh, I'll distribute these slides after for all of the detail, but essentially what I want to illustrate is that <coughs> there has been this proliferation of mobile health tools all over the world, many of which overlap a lot. There's an obstetric neonatal care pathway in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Indonesia, all essentially the same. But the reason why they are proliferating is that, although simple, they work really well. And so that was, please. Do you think they're going to remain fragmented, or do you think there's going to be a larger consolidation later? I think we'll move to a larger consolidation. That's, I think, the point that I'm going to try and eke out, that we're moving from this highly fragmented uh, world of mobile health where grassroots organizations are developing bespoke solutions, and we're moving towards a more integrated system. Yeah, that's a good question. Feel free to ask questions um, throughout. Yeah. In, in terms of, can you go back one? Sorry, because yeah. looking at like the, these maps in each country, or there's, there's many different people in these places. What are some ways, and this might be addressed later, a better time to answer, but uh, are you thinking of like keeping them culturally sensitive, especially if it is becoming a larger, more integrated system? Yeah, that's a really valuable point. I don't touch on it too much, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a valid concern. I think part of the reason why these tools have been useful is that they're often developed by people on the ground mm -hmm. who are working as community health workers. There is probably something to be learned from experiences elsewhere, and there are some transferable attributes of all of these technologies. But, you know, uh, the neonatal care pathway in Indonesia, probably in Muslim countries, is very different, it looks very different to some of the end health tools that have had success in Nigeria or South yeah. Africa. Okay, so that's, I think, a really big picture overview of the state of play at the moment and traditionally in telemedicine. Right? It has been an ecosystem uh, dominated in the developing world by you know, SMS-based reminders, uh, predominantly in you know, neonatal and maternal care, and in the developed world by video chat services that allow doctors to connect with people remotely. And for most physicians out there, when you say telemedicine to them, that's still what they think about. But what, I'm, what I want to argue is that we are starting to see a, a shift. The title of this talk is was, was changed recently, just today. It may have been different from what you attributed earlier to week, but it's uh, telemedicine towards a, a new paradigm of participatory health. And that's the argument that I'd really like to eke out today, and leave plenty of time for questions. That we are moving from this state of play towards a new paradigm within telemedicine. One of the main drivers for that paradigm shift is a changing disease burden internationally. This is a slide that all the medical students will be very familiar with, the fact that non-communicable diseases, chronic disease, is far and away the largest burden of disease internationally around. Even in Africa and Asia, where many might think that you know, the, the traditional communicable diseases, malaria, etc., are still the largest burdens of disease, that is no longer the case. Diabetes, heart disease, are the leading you know, drivers of um, you know, daily disability adjusted life years and mortality, uh, even in low and middle income countries. Right? So, this is a slide a little bit um, out of date, it's from 2011, so this, this figure is much higher, but 36 million deaths back then annually from you know, this range of what are called non communicable diseases. 
and the Sustainable Development Goals that were an update on the Millennium Development Goals released by um, the UN and the WHO in 2015 are really taking this into account, right? This is the new paradigm of healthcare that we are targeting in non-communicable diseases. And with that has come, I think, or we are seeing a shift in what telemedicine looks like. Right? So we are moving from telemedicine being a way for clinicians to communicate with remote patients towards these sort of semi-automated platforms for patients to control their own medical care. <laughs> and that's what I mean by participatory health. Right? We are going from communication to engagement. So over the next few slides, I'm just going to showcase um, a few technologies from this area, from around the Bay Area, from Stanford specifically, um, that are pioneering in this space of patient engagement. And then we'll try and draw out some lessons from you know, what are the emerging trends that we're seeing across these technologies. The first is a company called Omada Health. Um, have people in the room heard about Omada? Some among you. They're based up in San Francisco. Um, they're one of the first portfolio companies of Rock Health, a big digital health incubator and now venture capital company. Um, and essentially what Amada does uh, is, is they're targeting pre-diabetic patients. Right? So patients with some of the early features of uh, insulin resistance who still have the potential not to develop into full-blown diabetes. And all of the existing evidence suggests that lifestyle modification, more than pharmacological interventions, is the best therapy for this group, right? Diet and exercise. And Amada has packaged that into a very slick technology platform that you know, includes a connected scale and an app for the patient and a health coach that you can contact and then perhaps a more gimmicky feature like a connected tape measure, which you may or may not need. But, you know, a really nice packaging of uh, what they frame as a behavior modification service. Right? And essentially, patients are taken through a 16-week boot camp where they get reminders, they have this health coach assigned to them, they are interacting with, with their clinicians and their nutritionists and this multidisciplinary care team on a daily basis. Uh, and, and the system is trying to you know, personalize to their tastes, you know, personalize to their behavior. And I think what has made them out of particularly good and why it's often used as this case study of you know, uh, this new breed of health engagement technologies is that they publish. They try to get evidence to support their intervention. Um, I really encourage you to, to read this paper. There are, um, it's, it is often criticized because it doesn't have a robust control group. But nonetheless, in, in, in an era where we are so lacking in evidence for digital health, and where so few people are really publishing, this was one of the um, you know, early studies that showed that using Omada's platform actually led to positive outcomes in this patient and a lower rate of conversion into you know, diabetes among this pre-diabetic population. A second company I wanted to illustrate or showcase was is Health Loop, um, based just in Mountain View here. And they are really targeting patients after a hospital admission. So they recognize that when a patient is in hospital, you know, they have a deluxe care package very often, they have very high touch, then all of a sudden they get discharged and they really struggle with to, to continue, um, there's, there's a lack of continuity in their care. So they develop this tech platform that tries to continue care outside the hospital wall. And for the patient, that looks like reminders, uh, this sort of <coughs> chatbot, uh, chance to connect back to their clinician and ask questions, uh, a 
way to track symptoms over time. And then for the clinician, you know, they get essentially a dashboard of all of their patients. They can be alerted if there are some concerning uh, symptoms that have been reported. They are reminded to check in with their patients from time to time. The reason it's called the health loop is that it's, it's trying to close that loop on you know, patients who are discharged and then end up, end up falling out of care. This is just another picture of, of what the clinician view looks like. And again, the text is a little bit blurry, but you can see that alert triggered seven hours ago, incisional drainage is concerning for this patient, Donald Jones, who's post um, coronary bypass grafting. This is something that you clinicians need to know, they want to know. But at the moment, there are no easy ways for a patient to communicate that back to the clinician without you know, coming in for a little bit of it. And once again, they have attempted to publish. Now, uh, this is a small study that used HealthWoods platform to test one outcome, which was how that they selected a population of patients who were about to undergo diagnostic imaging. And they gave them either health loop or standard paper-based educational resources. And then they asked, how well do you understand this concept of ionizing radiation and radiation exposure that you're about to undergo um, in this imaging study? And they found that patients you know, using this more holistic, integrated tech solution had a better understanding of this one particular concept. Baby step. A third, um, again based in San Francisco, a spin out out of Stanford, is a company called Recovery Record. But again, a very similar solution that's using reminders and uh, apps for patients and clinicians, but it's targeting this particular use case of eating disorders. And what's been great about their technology is that they integrate with the electronic health records that are used in eating disorder clinics. And they're now used by 40% of private eating disorder <coughs> clinics across the country. Over 100,000 patients that have used or are using this app. Um, again, a way for them to communicate remotely and at their, you know, uh, at their pace, if you like, or at their leisure with uh, their clinician, which in this case can be a psychologist or an eating disorder therapist. And once again, they have, you know, they have attempted to publish about how this impacts patient satisfaction and patient outcome. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something that the whole industry has been struggling with. How do you make this sustainable as a business model? Each one of these examples so far has been a little bit different. Um, in some cases, companies go to the insurance provider and say, you know, this is something that Amada does publicly. Um, you know, we will save you this cost by preventing patients from becoming diabetics, right? And so uh, it makes sense for you financially to enroll your patients in the system, uh, have this upfront cost, but then reduce you know, the ongoing costs of insulin and hypoglycemic medication, et cetera, et cetera. That's one model. Another model is to sell to health systems directly. And that's more along the lines of what um, Recovery Record has been doing so far. They go to the eating disorder clinics. They'll say, this is a value-added service that you can use to differentiate yourself from other clinics. Right? This is a way to deliver better care to your patients, to um, you know, keep in touch with them even outside the clinic, and will promote patient retention. So that's a second strategy, really trying to be uh, to approach health systems and say this is a point of difference. Um, and, and then a third is to actually get patients themselves to pay, and that's surprisingly been, been less. Common, I think there is still an aversion from the patient side and from clinicians to sell something, especially sell a software to, to their patients. Um, but that might come. Yeah. But it's a really good question. Finally, very briefly, this is uh, an app called Cancer Aid. This is actually the company that I used to be a part of. 
uh, again, a very, very similar setup, but for oncology care, delivering patient information, um, allowing patients to create a bit of a profile or portfolio of their cancer journey, to journal about their symptoms, and then to connect with other patients who might be in a similar situation to them. So, what I want to illustrate is that we're seeing this paradigm shift towards participatory healthcare. And I think this image really um, kind of captures that. This is the picture of Dana Lewis, who is one of the Medicine X E patients. The Medicine X is a Stanford organization that is trying to build bridges between the academic community and startup world trying to build bridges between patients and all of the technologists that are trying to build solutions for them. And one thing it does really well is that it has this community of e-patients. Yeah. I've alleged that the e-patients is a term that was coined some years ago. Uh, can stand for whatever you want, but empowered, engaged, equipped, enabled. There's something a bit techy about it. And Dana Lewis is um, you know, the epitome of the epitome of an e patient, um, in that she is a patient with type 1 diabetes who was dissatisfied with the solutions available on the market to track her blood sugar level. And she actually went and developed with her husband, who's an engineer, a um, glucose monitor and uh, insulin pump that. Has some proprietary algorithm behind it and was able to deliver her better sugar control than anything on the market. She developed that like in their garage with her husband. And I, the reason I tell this story is that over the last decades, e patients have been people who are really outliers who go and develop this technology in their garage. Um, and who will speak on stage and who are amazing. But, you know, by implication, normal patients are not e patients. Right? They're not engaged. And I think what we're seeing is that these kinds of technologies are turning normal patients into e patients, right? engaged, empowered patients. This is a diagram illustrating. The changes on both sides of the equation. We're seeing a change from the patient perspective with these integrated tech solutions that provide information, that help communicate with their healthcare providers, that allow them to see their medical data, see their test results and clinical notes, whereas previously that had been you know, siloed away um, in filing cabinets in the medical system. And for health providers as well, on the other side of the equation, these platforms are starting to show benefit. They're starting to show that they improve outcomes for patients, that you know, they can be a, um, a tool to deliver preventative medicine right, because they deliver education to patients in an interactive and easily digestible way. And they can you know, minimize um, the workload and, and burden, in some cases, of care providers right, by preventing an unnecessary admission right, or preventing that visit to, um, to the cardiologist because they might be able to deliver that little bit of advice to up titrate your amniotarone. Um, probably not amniotarone, but you know, up titrate your um, antihypertensive drug uh, just remotely, you know, rather than you know, with, the, with the back and forth of clinic business. But as a result of these benefits that we're starting to see, we've seen this crazy pro proliferation of digital health tools. This is a busy slide for a reason, because there is so much um, activity and interest in this space that it has become crowded and saturated. Um, especially here in the Bay Area, there are so many different companies working on patient engagement tools. And we've seen that reflected in, in both the amount of investment that's been put in into these uh, technologies, but also you know, the, the revenues that they're starting to generate. 
Um, and this is not something that is just in the US. The colors here represent different regions around the world. And we're seeing this as an international trend that mobile health, digital health platforms are expanding um, significantly. Now there are some caveats to all of this. The first is that, as mentioned before, there is still a paucity of evidence. Very few digital health technology companies uh, have published you know, validation data. Despite the millions of dollars being funded by, you know, pumped into them by venture capitalists down the road, we still yet to see some like, really robust canon of medical literature around digital health. And this is a really good article that I'd encourage you to read from the Medical Catalyst, um, you know, why real world results are so challenging for digital health. And the second caveat is that I think we need to keep front and center what patients and providers want. This was uh, results of an an interesting study done by Deloitte about what are the key attributes of a digital health tool that are important to you as a provider or as a patient. The most important for a patient was giving me understandable info on symptoms and medical conditions. Help me communicate with my doctor or nurse. Allow me to examine my health records and my medical tests online. And for providers, it would provide trustworthy and accurate information. Make it easy to use, simple, well-designed, and provide guarantee that my personal data is secure. So to finish, um, I want to showcase some of the emerging trends that we see across this sector. The first is this idea of social medicine. That is, forming patients into care teams with patients' life events, or even if other patients don't have exactly the same conditions, patients who are able to support them in their journey. There is this wonderful site called Patients Like Me that tries to link you to other patients in a similar situation. So that, because I guess what, what this is building on is that ultimately there is a bit of a disconnect between um, you know, the kind of support that um, a, a doctor can provide or a healthcare provider can provide versus what another patient, another human going through that same journey as you can provide. Right? And, and a lot of apps and Technology companies and, and the health systems are starting to recognize this and form patients into care groups or give them a way through uh, an app or a website to, to find other patients like them. And patients like me is one example of that. Real Life is another tech example uh, of that, based again up in San Francisco. Um, this is not a new idea. Um, the Norwegian health system has been doing this for a long time. As soon as you are diagnosed with diabetes, you're put into a care program with other you know, newly diagnosed diabetic patients. This is not new, but it's shown to work for a long time. And the only change is that now technology is helping to assist that matching. The second trend is around clinical decision support for your patients. Trying to bring some intelligent diagnostics of intelligent clinical decision making into the hands of the patient. The two examples here are one from HealthTap, which is down the road on University Avenue, and from your MD, which is a UK-based company. Both, you know, along with a suite of other tools, try and you know, bring primary care decision making and triage onto a patient's phone. You tell this app your symptoms, it takes you through some basic diagnostic algorithm, it comes up with a differential diagnosis, and you know, makes some rudimentary suggestions about when, when you need to seek help and what kind of doctor you might want to talk to. This is still early days for you know, the doctor AI, but um, you know, 
this is certainly an emerging trend that they're trying to use. Uh, it may not even be AI, it's a very, very simple you know, clinical algorithm, but actually give that to the patient. A third trend is around home diagnostics. So this is building on this idea that traditional med medical care uh, relies on you know, a patient going to your physician, test the order, you go and get the test, then you come back to the physician, you wait in the waiting room, they make a decision, they send you somewhere else, you wait in another waiting room. Care is very is linear in a certain way relying on patients waiting for the care provider. What we're starting to see is that medical care is becoming asynchronous because of some of these technologies. So a patient can interact with the health system in their own time. They can, in this case, perform their own test at home, at, at their own leisure, and then connect with the health provider when they need it. This particular example is from a company called Healthy IO. Um, which provides like home urine testing kits. So it's powered by a mobile phone, they have some little test strips, you can um, drop some urine on this test strip, take a photo with your mobile phone, and then it will analyze the urine histic for you. And then make some suggestions about what you might want to do based on some other symptoms that you put in. This is what the test strip looks like. And there are a flurry of these kinds of tools that are um, trying to bring diagnostics into the home. A controversial one, again, around the corner with Belimos, trying to you know, really democratize medical testing, but it didn't go so well. But there are a number of other companies that um, are showing a lot more promise. And the final point that I want to make, the final emerging trend, is that with all of these health apps and devices, we are starting to get uh, this, this massive accumulation of digitized health data that has never existed before. And I think this is the most interesting and, and you know, tricky question around the future of telemedicine and digital health. You know, who will control that data? Or where will that data lie? This idea of a personal health cloud a portfolio, if you like, of your personal health record that is visible to the patient and travels with the patient. And there are a number of different stakeholders who are trying to control that process. There are groups out in industry, startup labs. The one on the left is this dashboard from a company called Health Ann. On the right is a company called Dakadu. Both are trying to synthesize uh, a lot of the, the streams of health data uh, into a single patient record that the patient keeps. And back in this case, they're actually going a step further and trying to calculate some overall health score that is supposed to encapsulate you know, your level of healthiness. Um, but in any case, they, they are trying to be these, these synthesizers. The big tech companies are trying to do this. Right? Health kit from Apple, the, the health cloud from Salesforce, Amazon is making plays in this area, you know, to be the data warehouse for your personal health identity. Of course, the big vendors, the electronic health record software vendors, oh, they, they, are the, uh, they are the incumbents in this space, but they are moving towards more patient-driven uh, health record management. Ethics, Turner, Allscripts, Athena, you know, they all have patient portals where a patient can view their health record remotely outside the hospital. And then finally, governments around the world, less so in the US, but around the world are trying to you know, play in this space too and be the broker for health information. In Estonia, they, they've been one of the real leaders internationally in this space, um, where they rolled out 10 years ago a uh, cloud or digital health record has now become a cloud health record um, where you know, any health provider system-wide can be, and the patient can do that as well. The reason I mention this is that the former president of Estonia, who 
I need this whole system is sitting down the road in the Antenna building at the show over here at Stanford. And you know, from closer to home, from, from Australia, this is the, the, the same trend has appeared. The Australian government is rolling out what's called a My Health Record, which again is a digital health record that travels with the patient and is visible to the patient. Yeah. Uh, recently, it was announced that this would be an opt-out system. So unless you specifically choose not to have your records on this platform, anytime you go to a hospital, you get discharged somewhere, anytime you buy medication, the data from that health encounter will be pushed to the cloud. Um, this is being rolled out as we speak, and by the end of 2018, it will be the largest uh, digital health record system in the world. It's 25, 26 million people predicted to be on it. So in conclusion, I think here are the key take-home messages that I want to evoke. One is that telemedicine is more than just a video consultation. Two, that with the rise of chronic disease international, um, we are seeing the shift away from telemedicine as a communication tool towards telemedicine as a patient engagement platform. Three, beware of the level of evidence. Sometimes it is sorely lacking. And four, the biggest future trend and thing to look out for is who ends up controlling the landscape of digital health? And what becomes a legal framework? Will it be your Google Health Cloud? Will it be health annex? Will it be a government-based record? Will it be anything? That is still a question to be determined. Now we have about six minutes left, but I wanted to show you, well, actually just before that, there is some interesting follow-up reading, um, in particular a book by Eric Topol, a cardiologist, um, a technologist at UCSC for the HCC now, about this paradigm shift. Um, but I want to leave you with this video. Um, in the spirit of personal health clouds and you know, the digitization of health records, there is, there is cause to be concerned. There's cause for concern. And this is not a new thing. Um, this is a video from over 10 years ago that was published by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, um, about the kinds of risks that the government um, any large organization in that matter controlling a lot of your data. So that's the way it's just ending with this. I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's auto supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yeah? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pieces. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this one. What do you mean? So the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows you to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability.
Want to stop this from happening? Without comment. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, I think we're at the time. I'll hang around uh, for a while if anyone wants to chat. Thank you. Yeah, we probably have time actually for one or two questions before. Yeah. Which of you have a question? Yeah, it's probably a public health system. Um, so if you were to put a label on it, it would be single payer. But there still is this parallel stream of health insurance companies. And the way it works is that um, you're actually strongly incentivized through government tax breaks to sign up for private health insurance. Um, so if you earn below a certain threshold, you will have public health insurance, and then you will be covered as an under public system. So if you earn above a certain amount, then it ends up being cheaper to subscribe to private health to private health insurance. Um, so there is this sort of dual system. At the end of the day, it doesn't look a whole lot different if you're a public patient or a private patient. You end up getting essentially the same care. The only difference with a public patient is that you might get and your, your choice of physician when you're going through like two procedures, you might have slightly shorter wait time, things like that. Yeah, that's a really on the money question. Um, in that you can really only see systemic change if the behavior structures adapt with it. And part of the challenge so far with both telemedicine and you know, the broader field of digital health is that you know you haven't really been in, there's been no reimbursement number of reimbursement code to um, to claim for that. But we are starting to see a shift. So there are now there's a limited number of digital health therapeutics that have been have qualified for like essentially a reimbursement code. So that's starting. Um, insurance companies have started to see the value. And you know, in cases like Armada and recently with Recovery Record, it's the insurer who is actually paying because they see the long term financial benefits. Um, but yeah, this is this is going to be a, 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 a shift. Thank you so much. So oh. one, one, okay. 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 No problem. Thank you. I spent a couple of months studying in Australia two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in Oh, is that an I heard about that through marine biology. Yeah. There are some tools that because there are some cultural sensitivities mm -hmm. um, and some issues around sort of bringing those things in the system as well. So there have been some tools now. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Still today, the lack of sensitivity yeah. 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 is a midterm is seemingly right. Well, I guess I think it's not. I think it's not. Hey, hi. Um, physics and psychology. Oh, oh thank you so much. Perfect. Did everyone sign in? Yeah. So, hey, I had a question. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You um, went on the MIT seminar last year. Oh, yes, you were there. I saw you. Yes, yes, yes. I did. Okay, I awesome. Did. I wanted to, like, the director's 
sure. You and I just wanted to like ask yeah, about your experience because yeah. I had to leave early when oh, you were no talking worries. about it. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was okay. It was an amazing experience. Are you on bio? Are you on bio? No, I'm bio. Okay. bio. Are you um, on bio? I'm on bio. Bob okay. is my faculty. Yeah, that's a really so it's a really good way, way yeah. to get to know your uh, faculty member. Well, we He's awesome. Like I love Bob. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a very oh, thank you so much. Oh, is this yours? Okay. Thank you. You're an angel. Thank you. Oh, here. See that. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, definitely very structured and busy too. Like wake up super early at like six a.m. Because activities all day, lunch activities all day. But it's really cool things that you wouldn't really be able to do anywhere else. So like we get to explore, like we get to visit all these villages, we go to hiking, we go to wilderness. I don't know, it's crazy things. Um, a lot of fun. I like in, like in towns like. Quite a lot of hiking, yeah, you gotta like be ready to go, but like it's an amazing experience. Yeah. 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 yeah, I really want to apply. You should like, apply. Yeah, yeah. definitely apply. Is that the really one you're most excited about? I think so, yeah. I've, I've been to all of the different seminar like so presentations that they had, and that was one of the last ones. Like today, we have one on like conservation photography. And Steve McConnell is actually my advisor, okay. but then I still felt that like I don't know, I like like you're more Yeah, I'm going to Africa, it's South Africa. Um, uh -huh. Where's the conservation? Uh, yeah. South Africa. You can go to like yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I've never been to Namibia. Uh, another South Africa, and I, I went to Madagascar, and it's like you know, this is something that I could really own. Like I feel like South Africa. Really I, I've been a million times. I went to Namibia. Like you can go there, but like Namibia is a little bit more rural and remote, and yeah, like yeah. it's like something that it's that's what I think is really cool about this program is that like with Bob, he does things that you would not be able to do elsewhere. Which I'm probably saying like the group is not going to do, but I don't know. I think he's. Quite a character, and I love like Bob. Yeah, but he's quite a character. The other thing is that I really actually like think he's just like such a cool person. Right on like, your app. Right on the app. You think so? Oh yeah. He's so I'm like, I just think you're really cool. Well, because I, I had, um, I don't know if you know Stephanie. She, she took his, she took like his photography class, and she's also in his um, sophomore seminar. I actually applied to sophomore seminar. I got in, but then I had a family conflict, so I couldn't go, and I was like. We'll write about that. So sad. Yeah. That I would have honestly he loves it when he votes to come to the <laughs> I'm serious. I do love Bob, but he does. So I would definitely <laughs> mention why you decided to get Sean on your app. And we'll talk about like I think some of the questions was like why do you wanna <laughs> why do you wanna be it's on this is. yeah with yeah. me? <laughs> and as we are talking about how um you said all the different parts of it and the community and the program, blah blah blah, and definitely like yeah. you're like up for like Roughing it a little. It will be roughing a little bit, but that's yeah, what we're going to I don't really mind that. Yeah. yeah. I think my thing is just like, I don't really have a connection so with like, what is it saying? What do you mean? Connection to what? To, to like, not, not necessarily like the material. Like, I think it's really interesting, but I don't really have too much background on like okay. geography and like. Then write about that. Write about like, <laughs> that's something you want to learn more about. I, do you have, have you done any, like, what is your bio focus? Um, more like cell and developmental bio. So you didn't write about that, but like, I'm interested in health. Or are you pre health? Yes. Okay, I'm interested in health. But I've like not really explored it outside of the cell and de developmental thing, so yeah. that's why I'm excited about having the opportunity to learn about it here. Yeah, totally. You like that? Oh yeah, <laughs> I totally. Will. Yeah, and um, yeah. Even you could also like even. I mean, it's probably it's a little busy now. Yeah. You're gonna send him an email if yeah. I were you, being like, hi, so like, I'm excited about your so yeah. pro. Yeah. I mean, you're you're on <laughs> your own seminar. Like, is there maybe can I stop by to ask you questions? Yeah, mm -hmm. just like show your interest is always good. Yeah, like yeah. stick out a little bit. Um, and if he's not, I know his mom's in town, so he's kind of busy right now. So yeah. he's not free, then he's not free, but at least he like has the email. Yeah. And if he doesn't respond, don't think he's probably not here. But um, yeah, you should definitely apply. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. You can say that you talk to me. And um, no, no, no. I mean, like I talk to my students. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I talk, like not like like I talk to Ashley and like you know we're describing like the different adventures y'all went on. It's kind of really, really exciting. Something like yeah. Like, yeah. I think that. He wants to make sure that students like yeah. know what they're getting into. Yeah. 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 yeah, which it sounds like you are. Yeah, yeah I'll put in a good word for you. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, That'd be yeah. awesome. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, what's your name again? Ami. Ami. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll send him an email. Probably send like, him an email. Yeah. yeah. Him an email. Asking him um, some like random questions that I had and just being like, I think you're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Send him, do it. And if he doesn't respond in like three days, send a follow up because I guarantee you he exactly. would love to see. Yeah. But um. He's it such a good guy, and he yeah. really cares about his students, and like he'll make things happen for the teacher. They have that yeah, too. I've heard that because I also yeah. um, do you know Alex? Like, yes, yes. yes. I went to Madagascar with Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Alex. He was my bio TA. Oh my god. Okay, tell, mention Alex. Can you talk to Ashley and Alex? <laughs> you're, you're good. Um, <laughs> no, I fucking love Alex. He's the best. Oh my god. Oh, yeah, I know. We had I'm, so much fun. See, like we became really good friends, and um, I don't know. Do you know Joe Lagner? Yes. Oh my gosh, I know Joe. He's in my favorite class. Okay, Joe, I met in Madagascar, and we're like homies, homies. So you would make fun friends there. Yeah, 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 it's a good experience. That's what I really like. Like, he talked about specifically, he 
is like, oh, I changed. I try to like break up social groups and like and he make does. everyone he interact. Does. And, and everyone like, does. It's nice. That's nice. Apply. Definitely apply to it. Yeah. It sounds. I think you'd be a really good fit for it. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, of course. Let me know if you have any questions too. Yeah, of course. If you're yeah, in love with this person. Yes, yes, yes. Angel. Yes, yes. Is there any action? Don't you're reminding me with your name? There is a lot of frustration and anger towards the big incumbent people. And like, yeah. you know, he's saying he's got an established billing yeah. systems initially, and like he can't really um, accustom himself to that. Yeah. Um, having said that, they are so well entrenched in the health system now that it's quite difficult to see yeah. them really being toppled out. I mean, unless look at. In, in other countries where the government can really come in and say, we are going to develop this workforce outside, I think that has promise. But in the United States, I think the only viable alternative, the only likely alternative to an ethical experiment is one of these big systems within the right. health care system. And that's not the same. Um, I think it will throw a lot of people off the hook. And we won't have money for a little while. <laughs> area you have a higher likelihood of finding out in these mm. health systems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's 